Buckle up, Buttercup, because this is nuts. A significant feature change to the Bcash FS file system is being blocked from being incorporated into the Linux kernel, not because of technical reasons, but because of a code of conduct issue that has been opened by the Linux Foundation's code of conduct board relating to the main developer of Bcash FS. So they are literally blocking the implementation of technical features that look to be pretty darn good into the Linux kernel because of a code of conduct issue, as far as we can tell. This is this is nuts. Uh, this is a post by Kent Overstreet, the main developer behind Bcash FS. He posted this over on his Patreon uh, 17 hours ago, and this is absolutely wild. I'm going to walk you through exactly what's happening here as far as we can tell. Um, his little too long didn't read summary. The future of Bcash FS in the kernel, the Linux kernel, is uncertain and lots of things aren't looking good. Linus has said he is not accepting my 6.13, meaning the Linux kernel version 6.13, which is the next release, the one that's being worked on right now, pull request per quote, an open issue with the code of conduct board, end quote. And at this point, I have no idea what's going on with the code of conduct board. I, for my part, according to Kent Overstreet, um, have felt for quite some time that there are issues about our culture and the way we do work that need to be raised. And that hasn't been going anywhere. Hence this post. I I'm going to this whole thing is long. I will link directly to this article so you can read it in full. It goes into a tremendous amount of detail, but I'm going to skip down way, 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 way down here. If you want all the details, go read the article. But where we want to really get into the code of conduct issue, which is absolutely fascinating, I'm going to read his summary of it, and then I'm going to show you the actual Linux kernel patches and pull requests and emails and whatnot, so we can kind of make some sense of all this. Um, so his interactions with the code of conduct board, quote, to start with, I was approached at Plumbers. Plumbers is the name of the Linux kernel conference, a, a yearly gathering of Linux kernel developers. They call it the Plumbers Conference. I was approached at Plumbers by one notable code of conduct member and stable kernel maintainer. And in that, now when he says stable kernel maintainer, he's not saying that the person is stable. That's the stable version of the Linux kernel. They maintain several versions of the Linux kernel. A next version, I mean what's coming down the pipe, stable version, and then some, some older versions. They, they keep kind of those two separate. Uh, so he was approached by one notable code of conduct member and stable kernel maintainer in that in, and in that conversation while pressuring me to follow the code of conducts process he spoke quite a bit about how this was important for our community's image and quote made repeated mentions about how it would be a quote this is a direct quote shame if i wasn't around anymore <laughs> It would be um it would be a shame if you uh, would fail to uh uh adhere to our code of conduct and if you wasn't around no more. I mean it's kind of hard to read anything other than a mafia shakedown out of that, right? Um he goes on to say quote it's hard to read ta the talk of image as anything other than perhaps corporate friendly and I bring that up because that is another sentiment I heard at the plumbers conference from another high level Linux kernel maintainer and elsewhere that Linux is quote for the big tech companies now in those exact words. Um, okay, let, let's, let's move down the line. Oh, there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. I will link to this so you guys can all read it, but he goes on to say, quote, and it didn't help matters any that before our talk, that little chat he had where, where it would be a shame if you was not around no more. In casual conversation with others right outside the conference, the very same code of conduct member managed to call every single file system community member who came up by name a, quote, beep hole. I'm, 
I'm censoring myself, but if you're watching the video, you can read it on the screen. It's a naughty word. You're not supposed, kids at home don't say that word. But so this one, this one person who was pushing code of conducts and, and on the Linux kernel was out there calling the file system developers beep holes. Needless to say, he continues, such conduct is not the norm at conferences and is no more acceptable there than on the list. Rules for me and not for thee. Uh, he makes a pretty good point there. Um, later interactions over email became even more absurd. So then, uh, then there was some conf some some conflict. Now uh, I think I've got the conflict here. Nope, that's the code of conduct. Here we go. There was a conversation that occurred on the Linux kernel mailing list, and I'm pretty sure this is the conversation that resulted in the code of conduct issues. Um, I'm going to read it to you now uh, so that you understand the context here. This is uh, Kent Overstreet writing to um, uh, an individual named Michael, another developer. Michael, if you think crashing processes is an acceptable alternative to error handling, you have no business writing kernel code. You have been stridently arguing for one bad idea after another, and it's an insult to those of us who do give a beep about writing reliable software. You are arguing against basic precepts of kernel programming. Get your head examined and get the beep out of here with this beep. Okay, that was the one. I'm pretty sure that is the email that is causing the code of conduct issue. Now, it should be noted, it should be noted very clearly that that email, while it contains swearing uh, and it is somewhat <coughs> abrasive and not exactly super kind, um, is not out of the norm for the Linux kernel mailing list. In fact, Linus Torvalds himself has sent many emails along these lines this year alone that are, I would say, five to ten times more severe than this. So this is the leadership of the Linux kernel and the Linux Foundation employees are, are setting the precedent that this is the norm, right? So it's not... It's not like they're opposed to swearing, and it's not like they're opposed to saying that you need to get your head examined. Uh, we we literally just uh, did a story about uh, Linus Torvalds uh, yelling at people and telling them how they were basically stupid and needed to learn how to read a book or something like that. Like it's this is normal for the Linux kernel mailing list. Um, to which an individual from the Linux foundation's code of conduct board responded kent using language like this is clearly unacceptable and violates the code of conduct this type of language does not promote respectful and productive discussions and is detrimental to the health of the community you should be well aware of this type of language and personal attack is a clear violation of the linux kernel contributor code of Co contributor covenant code of conduct more on that in a moment as outlined in the following um and then uh to which uh, some hours later uh kent who had written the <coughs> email with some swearing in it uh responded that quote I believe Michael and I have more or less worked this out privately, and you guys have been copied on that as well. So they worked it all out. Everything was fine, right? They they dealt with their their issue between each other, their conflict, and they were done. They moved on. Um, so then things got, got kind of weird and apparently devolved from there. Qu quote, later interactions over email became even more absurd with Shua, uh, the individual who chastised uh, him on about the contributor code of conduct that I just read, at first talking about having a conversation, then later making it clear that conversation would only be about getting me to write a public apology with zero room for discussing anything else. Uh, and it just kind of goes on from there. So, uh, so that, that happened there. But I want to read this to you because this is where I think it gets really weird. Let's dive right into this. So that same person, uh, Shua Khan, who had sent that email to, to the mailing list saying, hey, that's a violation of the code of conduct. On, uh, so last Thursday, November 14th, submitted a patch changing the code of conduct committee's rules and procedures officially, right? So this this happened this last Thursday on the 14th. Now, this change was 
uh, was reviewed and approved by Linux Foundation leadership and by Linus Torvalds himself. So Linus saw these changes were happening after that conflict kind of kicked off right after people were yelling at each other a bit and linus said yeah i want these changes now what are these changes exactly well i'm going to scroll down i'm going to show you exactly what these changes are and i'm going to read these to you so what they did is they added that when someone does something that the code of Con conduct committee does not like that person must make a public apology for their violation. Quote, a public apology for the violation is the first step towards rebuilding the trust. Trust is essential for the continued success and health of the community, which operates on trust and respect. Now, if the person who does something wrong does not provide a public apology, like such as on the Linux kernel mailing list, that the Code of Conduct Committee likes, then things immediately ramp up and they get banned from submitting patches and changes. This is true. So um, the Code of Conduct Committee determines the next, and these are all new, brand new rules. They just came up with these last week. The Code of Conduct Committee determines the next course of action to restore the healthy collaboration by recommending remedial measures uh, for approval. Specifically, ban violator, so the person who did something wrong, ban violator for participating in the kernel development process for a period of up to a full kernel development cycle. The Code of Conduct Committee could require public apology as a condition for lifting the ban. The scope of the ban for a period of time could include A, denying patch contributions and pull requests. B, pausing collaboration with the violator by ignoring their contributions and or blocking their email accounts. And C, restricting their ability to communicate via kernel.org platforms such as mailing lists and social media sites. So that came in. I mean, it's, it's, it's extreme, right? So basically what they're saying is if the code of conduct committee does not like what you did, what you said, something, they will, they can stop you from being able to get your code changes into the Linux kernel. And they did. So the very next day, Friday, November 15th, there, here he comes. Kent Overstreet sends in his patch for Bcash FS for the Linux kernel 6.13 release, which is the one that's being worked on right now. 6.12 just finished. 6.13 work is 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 getting underway and testing and all that sort of thing. So he's got boom a a big patch with some new features of that file system to be implemented. And, and there's there's all the details on it. It's a really regular regular sort of patch. It's a regular request. Here it is. Here's my pull request, right? That came in and denied. <laughs> instantly denied. He's out of luck. He cannot get the code changes in because of that code of conduct violation. Now, again, the code of conduct violation is bizarre because if, if it is what it appears to be, if it is that email that I read to you where he was essentially, Kent was just swearing a little bit, Kent, naughty with the potty mouth, <laughs> but Linus does that all the time or telling people they're dumb, <laughs> which again, Linus does all the time. If your leadership does it and that's not a problem, well, then everyone else can do it too. That's just kind of the way it works. Another thing that's really interesting here is that the Linux foundation and Linux kernel leadership, they regularly violate their own code of conduct in a wide variety of ways, in extreme ways. And we're not just talking about the fact that they're swearing or being abrasive or abusive of each other. They've been doing that for the last couple decades, right? That hasn't stopped. It goes in waves, but it's it, it happens a lot. It's just part of it. And half the time when Linus does it, if people screenshot the, the email to the mailing list where Linus is like, don't be retarded. And then everyone's like, ah, oh, Linus is being Linus-y again. And it's, it's kind of entertaining, right? But the Linux Foundation and the Linux kernel team they violate the code of conduct in far more extreme ways. I'm going to read from their code of conduct. I've got it up on the screen for those of you watching the video version. 
The code of conduct for the Linux Foundation and the Linux kernel is a variation, a mild variation, on what is known as the Contributor Covenant Code of Conduct, which is written by an extremist uh, guy that is just very, very extreme. I, I, I'm not going to go into that. It's a guy who, who calls himself Coraline and um, screams about people on the internet a lot and uh, and has just written some really, really off the wall, very extremist, weird political stuff and views the contributor code of conduct as an extremist political document. Like it's a document for political change. That's why it was written. That's according to that guy. Um why the Linux Foundation adopted it, at least in part, is confusing. Now, not all of it is bad. Um, there are some parts of it that are that are fairly reasonable. I'm, I'm going to read a little bit to you now, though, and then I'm going to show you how the Linux Foundation violates it so extremely. Quote, um, we as contributors and maintainers pledge uh, to making participation in our project, the Linux project, um, and our community, a harassment free experience for everyone, regardless of, and then they have a, a list of different attributes and whatnot that you can't be discriminated against because on the Linux kernel mailing list and in the Linux kernel project and the Linux foundation, but they include two things in there, ethnicity and nationality ethnicity and nationality. So you're saying that the Linux kernel and Linux foundation cannot discriminate against people based on ethnicity or nationality. That's their rules. Well, I don't know if any of you remember this, but just a little bit ago, uh, specifically on October 23rd, so less than one month ago, the Linux Foundation and the Linux kernel leadership began removing large sections of critical kernel developers because they were Russian or had Russian email addresses or had Russian sounding names. Uh, now, there are many reasons why this removal happened, and many of them are legal, specifically relating to the President Biden's Executive Order 14071, which forbids Russians from working with GPL projects that have Americans involved in them. So uh, if you have GPL software kind of based in the United States of America, which the Linux kernel is, uh, you cannot work with Russian developers, right? Developers living in Russia, Rush who have a Russian nationality, etc. Now, you may say that it is reasonable because of that executive order that the Linux Foundation adhered to the executive order, which means they adhered to the law of the land in which they lived. And so therefore they're banning people based on nationality and ethnicity. However, that runs in extreme contrast to their very own code of conduct, which says you cannot under any circumstances do that. Yet they have not updated their code of conduct to say, well, you can do that when uh, <clears throat> you'd get in trouble if you if you didn't if you didn't uh, discriminate based on nationality or ethnicity. They haven't done that yet. So what I'm saying is the Linux Foundation, they're, they're, they're just going forward and ignoring the code of conduct, except for when it's beneficial to them. Right. They're using the code of conduct as a weapon against specific individuals. Now, Kent Overstreet has been a very vocal man. He speaks out on things and speaks his mind. And you may like what he says. You may not like what he says. Me, I'm a mixed bag when it comes to Kent Overstreet. I looked through a lot of his emails and I'm like, I agree with that. I looked through other ones and I was like, whoa, that was a bit much. It's a mixed bag. But clearly people at the Linux kernel and Linux foundation, they're sick and tired of Kent Overstreet having opinions and they don't want to hear them anymore. And so they're taking steps to ban Kent Overstreet for doing the same things that not only do does Linus Torvalds himself do, but the individuals overseeing the code of conduct board itself do themselves in person, which Kent Overstreet documented in the in his uh, in his blog post. Now, what's what's really fascinating here is when you really dig into why this is happening, because this is this is not about upholding the code of conduct. Right. We've proven that. I mean, it, it's it's clear and obvious. It's so obvious that the Linux Foundation and the Linux kernel code of conduct board is really not dead set on upholding that code of conduct of theirs fully. They do it 
mm, piecemeal and only when it's beneficial to them, right? So that's not what this is about. And this is not about protecting open source, right? This isn't this isn't like some sort of quest to protect the image of the Linux kernel or the image of open source. The reality is that over 70% of the board members of the Linux Foundation are representatives of companies that are GPL violators. Repeat that again in a slightly different way to make sure that sinks in. The Linux Foundation... <clears throat> which brings in roughly a quarter of a billion dollars annually. Quarter of a billion. Everyone's like, wait a minute, how much money do they make? Yeah, a quarter of a billion. About 2% of that gets spent on Linux, by the way. In case you were wondering where that money goes, yeah, it's crazy. Um, so quarter of a billion dollars. Now, where does that quarter of a billion come in? It comes in from major corporations who purchase a seat on the board of directors of the Linux Foundation. That's how the board works. The Linux Foundation board of directors used to have elections. They used to have elections where public members could gain seats on the board of directors by a vote of just, you know, just regular contributors. Like you and me can contribute, whatever it is, a hundred bucks or something like that and become a member of the Linux Foundation, right? Not a big corporate board member, but we'd get a vote. They got rid of those public seats and went to a system where they are, where their board member seats are only purchased by big mega corporations with very deep pockets, Microsoft and, and Oracle and, and, and VMware and on and on and on. Of those companies, only 70% of them, 70% or more of them violate the GPL, usually with high regularity and don't stop even when they're sued about it. <laughs> So this is not about protecting Linux or the open source's image. Not at all. It couldn't be. Because if it was, the Linux Foundation would not staff themselves almost exclusively with GPL violators, right? And and let's be honest, the, the Linux Foundation makes so much money from these companies, the Linux Foundation doesn't use the restroom without complete support and approval from their corporate financiers. Right? I mean, that's a lot of money and they don't want to lose that money, all of which means that what we're seeing right now is the will of the companies like Microsoft and all the others that are paying for what the Linux Foundation does for whatever the motive, their motivation is. I'll leave that as an exercise to all of you, but it is clear that that is the case. Another thing that's worth that's worth mentioning is that up until very recently, and in fact, up until right now, up until uh, today, in case in point, the Linux kernel itself had a file system in it known as Riser FS. Riser FS was developed by, created by, and named after Hans Riser, a convicted murderer. So really, uh, you would say, well, isn't murder against the code of conduct of the Linux Foundation and, and Linux uh, kernel? No, it's not. It's absolutely not. It doesn't mention murder in there. It's not against the code of conduct. Um, that's funny by itself. That's that's funny right there. I mean, murder is not funny, but the fact that the code of conduct is being used because someone was abrasive on a mailing list, but uh, murder is okay. That's interesting. Um, but the, the fact that the riser FS named after a murderer who's in jail right now has been in the Linux kernel until today, literally November 21st, 2024 is when it's being removed means that uh, they're not really worried about image stuff uh, at all. Like, I mean, okay, so uh, so a convicted murderer, his name is part of the Linux kernel. If you were worried about image, you wouldn't have that be the case. If you were worried about the people adhering to being really nice to each other uh, in order to have their code allowed to be in the kernel, that wouldn't be the case, right? Which is just yet another example of, yeah, the fact what they're doing with BcacheFS, where they're not allowing it into, not allowing new updates into the kernel has nothing to do with image, 
It has nothing to do with adherence to a code of conduct or being nice to each other. It has nothing to do with protecting open source or Linux or any of that stuff. None of it, right? That's obvious, right? So I, I think that's that's worth noting. Another thing that needs to be noted here is that this is an ongoing pattern in open source and free software right now. As these organizations that have incredibly important open source and free software projects, uh, the Linux kernel, um, uh, some of the various free desktop projects, some of the projects out of Red Hat, um, Python, they are going through a problem where at, when they get large enough, that they attract the attention of individuals who seek to implement a code of conduct and a committee, which tends to have overarching powers over the project to use the code of conduct any way they see fit. As soon as that happens, we see massive disaster where individuals and contributions, technical contributions are blocked and technical individuals, contributors are blocked or removed or banned because of perceived code of conduct violations, oftentimes that are never even made public. And the few times that they are, it's usually over ridiculous things. Case in point, Python banned one of their most prominent contributors, someone who's been around since the earliest days of Python, because he mentioned enjoying Saturday Night Live back when a sketch aired on it that some people on the code of conduct committee took offense to. I'm not joking with this. He didn't just come. He didn't come out and say, I love that particular sketch so much. Everyone watch it. He just mentioned that back then he thought Saturday Night Live was funny. And they were talking about uh, the point counterpoint sketch with Dan Aykroyd and Jane Curtin from was it back in the 70s? It's a funny sketch. Um, <laughs> they're going to ban me for that now. But he simply mentioned enjoying it, so he got kicked out of the project for three months. Now, his ban should be lifted right about now. I'm going to be checking in on that shortly to see how that's going. But his ban should now be lifted. But uh, why, why ban someone over such a trivial thing? They're banning actual, and last I heard, by the way, the code of conduct people within Python and the Python Foundation were looking for ways to make temporary bans like that permanent. So they were looking for ways to change the rules and force it so that he could never come back. That's what I'd been hearing. So we'll see what's been happening. Um, I, if, if they've allowed him back, it won't be for long. And, the, and that's not the only example out there. I mean, like, look at Nix OS. We talked uh, uh, over the last few months, a few times about the Nix OS purge, as they called it. Essentially, people who were parts of the Code of Conduct Committee, see, a pattern, who gathered together and they said they don't like the personal politics uh -huh, of individuals who were long-term critical core technical contributors to NixOS, the, the Linux distribution packaging system, etc. So what did they do? They kick them out. <laughs> they kicked all those contributors out. They even forced the abdication of the founder of NixOS. They literally wrote him his abdication letter and demanded he send it out to people. I have a copy of all of it and all the people who wrote it, by the way. And I've, I've published that and talked about it in, uh, uh, in, a, in a past episode. Go check that one out. But So this is an ongoing pattern. This continues to be happening and it's getting crazier and crazier when the fact that when it when it hits the point where the Linux kernel itself is outright forbidding technical contributions because of very mild perceived code of conduct open issues, we got a problem. Because it's not about the code of conduct. It's not about the violations. It's not about protecting an image of Linux or the community or open source. It's not about any of that. Because they are not consistently applying it across the board. It is being these code of conduct issues are being selectively applied only to individuals who run afoul of those who have been 
for whatever reason, given the keys to the kingdom of being allowed to ban people and ban contributions and being sitting on these code of conduct committees and boards. This is, a, this is not a good pattern. And it's sad to see the Linux kernel in that because now we are, we are directly seeing the Linux kernel being worse off, right? Measurably, demonstrably worse. Less features, less technical contributors, long-time ones, renowned contributors, because of someone's political feelings, someone's, mm, someone's personal motives on a code of conduct board somewhere. That's not good. That's not good. I mean, we've been talking about this for a while now, how this is ramping up and this is causing qual software quality problems, software feature problems, technical issues. And now what's interesting is we can point to not one, not two, but huge numbers of projects, OpenSUSE and Python and NixOS, now the Linux kernel itself that are demonstrably worse because of this code of conduct, political witch hunt purging nonsense. It's crazy. It's utterly crazy. And what's truly, truly wild about all this is as all this is going on, once again, the Linux Foundation is silent. No statements. No responses to requests for comment. You know I've reached out. You know I'm not the only one who's reached out. And I'll put this out there into the world, and people at the Linux Foundation will watch it. And just like my coverage of, of uh, them banning all the, the Russian programmers, It'll be, they'll even link to it on the Linux kernel mailing list and talk about it. But they will not respond from the Linux Foundation. Linus will not respond. The Jim Zemlin, the head of the Linux Foundation, will not respond again. It's concerning. It's concerning because we look forward at the future and what does this mean? Does this pattern continue? It seems like it. It seems like it is continuing. And it's that that's sad. That sucks. That sucks for Linux. That sucks for Linux users. That sucks for Linux developers. That sucks for, you know, systems administrators. It sucks across the board. There's no, there's no win here. Or is there? Are there people that benefit from this? And again, I would point out that over 70% of the Linux Foundation board are GPL violators that pay together a quarter billion dollars a year to keep the Linux Foundation afloat. And the Linux Foundation doesn't take a poop, a poop, without the approval of that board. Who benefits? It's worth thinking about, and it's worth asking, and it's worth talking about. Uh, I want to say thank you to the Linux, uh, the Lunduke Journal, <laughs> uh, the Lunduke Journal subscribers out there. Go to lunduke.com. There's links to the, the podcast RSS feeds and where you can, you can listen to the podcast on iTunes and, and Spotify and everywhere else. You can watch the videos on Locals, on Rumble, on X, and on, on YouTube too. Though if you watch it over on uh, Locals, there's no, there's no ads. Highly recommend that. Also, if you want to subscribe to the Lunduke Journal to help support the work that I do, keep it ad free, keep it free from big tech influence, unlike the Linux Foundation, uh, you can go ahead and subscribe over at lunduke.locals.com. It's a great way to subscribe. Or if you just go to lunduke.com, there's all sorts of different ways you can contribute, you can help out, and it is really appreciated. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, Boys and girls, nerds and nerdettes, across this whole gosh darned inner tube, I do declare. End broadcast. <laughs>